Hello everybody, Raven Knight here. Now I've said in two previous videos that the For Honor lore has been suffering lately, and I stand by that. The lore is in desperate need of fixing. And I've proposed some clear ideas and directions that the story could go in, but we have another problem we need to address, and this problem is one you might not expect. It's a problem we have to fix before we can go any further with fixing the lore. But before we go into talking about this problem, I'd like to take a quick moment to remind everyone that I do have a second channel called Raven's Writing Room, where I talk more about story writing and even share some of my own stories and concepts with y'all. If you enjoy that this kind of content where I break down stories, writing, and issues in terms of storytelling, go subscribe to that channel. Link will be in the description. Alright, now, let's talk about the problem For Honor is facing. I was doing some online research the other day. And I found out something fascinating. Did you know that there are over 100 video games that feature Nazis as bad guys? I mean, that makes perfect sense. Nazis are an easy to recognize villain in our history and an easy to create as a de facto villain group to fight. When you need an objectively evil, malicious, and immoral group to call upon to be your villain, why not just keep using that golden goose? It makes sense. But see, in For Honor, we can't have the Nazis. So what do we do? Who was the villain in For Honor? Well, the fact is that aside from Apollyon, there was no real villain in For Honor's lore. The beauty of the setup in For Honor is that all the factions fought each other for personal reasons of honor. That's where the title comes from, For Honor. No villains or heroes, no good guys or bad guys. Each faction is fighting for their own people, their own ideals, their own religion, their own culture, their own resources. Their honor is what they're fighting and dying for. And Apollyon wasn't so much a villain as she was an antagonist, a clear target for you to fight against. But her motives were not to destroy you or the world, but rather to bring the war back and to remind the factions of this fact. For Honor was very creative because each faction had their own moral gray areas. All sides had problems to some degree, and thus it really didn't matter which faction you were with. You were going to get the goods and bads of that faction. <sighs> but then the writers put themselves into a difficult scenario with Year 4 Season 1, Hope. In this season, the factions were now talking peace with the Truce of Wyverndale, just like they did at the start of the original story campaign, and that was when Apollyon showed up to fix everything. So, obviously, we have to keep the war going, and we would need Apollyon to show up again to restart the war, but Apollyon's dead. So now, Astria fills that role. Astria and her Order of Horcos showed up and reignited the flames of war. Now, I don't think that what Astria did was as well done as what Apollyon did, and there were certainly flaws in the executions and approach, but for what it was, Astria got the job done. The war was back on. A tyrant versus a rebellion. And that was fine for a while. Hey, you know, that, that works. But now see, we have a new problem. The writers have started treating Horkos as the Nazis. They've treated Horkos as the easy villain to insert when they need a morally wrong event or action to take place. Oh, don't worry, it's not the culture or, or immoral aspects of these people that caused the unfortunate events that took place, it's just Horkos at work. The writers tried to walk away from this in year 5 with the different horrible disasters like the drought, the flood, and the sudden winter, but even the drought was said to have been caused by the shift in balance thanks to the Horkos and Chimera War, and then after year 5... Everything has been Horkos' fault, with the one exception of Bolthorn stealing the Scarab Bracelet. You know, that one good piece of lore to actually explore the moral nuance of Viking culture. Remember when we could do that kind of thing, folks? Alright, but let's move on from that. You might be asking yourself, or asking me more directly, Raven, what's wrong with having a de facto bad guy? Doesn't that make things easier to digest? Isn't it more simple when there's just an easy bad guy to follow and hate? Yeah, yeah, I'd agree, but there are three main flaws with this setup. First, well, if we're going to have a bad guy, where's the good guy? Have you noticed that Chimera has been largely ignored for the past two years of lore? Other than one Chimera banquet, Chimera has been involved with almost nothing. Chimera has become effectively meaningless in the lore, so it's hard for us to really appreciate the clashing of good and evil ideals when the good ideal is left behind. Now, the reason they've left Chimera behind is because we need an evil group to oppress the new Outlander cultures, so to draw in the mistreated and victimized Outlander heroes. I mean, we couldn't possibly have it be the result of those cultures coming to Heathmore themselves like the Wulin did. No, 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 no. We need them to be drawn here and show off how tough they are by taking the fight to the big bad guys. But we also don't want them joining the de facto good guys, because then that would shift the tide of the war. Having a de facto villain is fine, guys, I'm not saying it's not, but only when you have the good ideology to hold up against it, and that is sorely lacking. Think about it. 
By having the good guys absent and having the bad guys in power, every time they offend an Outlander culture, so that Outlander hero comes in, it makes them look morally good by contrast, and thus we don't think that there could be anything wrong with their culture. Which leads into my second problem. We're dealing with historical warriors. Historical cultures are filled with good and bad from all parties. I've heard lots of people tell me over the years that the knights are historically evil, so it makes sense that the majority of Horcos would appear knightly, and thus the knights are the bad guys. This shows a gross misunderstanding of European history. I don't deny that there were knights that did bad things, but there were knights that did good as well, just like the Vikings, just like the Samurai, just like Chinese warriors. And because of this, just resorting everything down to this side good, this side bad, detracts from this truth. Like I said, what was so nice about For Honor was its ability to explore the culture and nuance of these different groups and perhaps help us understand not just what they did, but why they did it. Remember when you started the campaign and you saw how the knights were being invaded by the Vikings, so you felt justified in taking the fight to them, but then you saw how you may have gone too far at one point? Do you remember how the Vikings were suffering, so it felt like it made sense for them to go and raid the mire to take what they needed? but ended up taking more than necessary, making you sympathize with the samurai? Just in time for you to play the samurai as they take back their home and then take the fight to Apollyon, only to realize they played right into our hands? Every faction you played had their moral highs and their moral lows. There was nuance, variety, diversity, reality. The same is true of the Wu Lin and Outlanders. But by making your Outlanders the victims of Horcos, you detract from some of the more negative aspects of their own culture, which could create natural conflicts on their own. For example, are we ever going to explore the Islamic expansion practices of the Ephira and the Arabic slave trade that was started during the Muslim Empire? That is a very real aspect of Islamic history that could be used to create conflict in later seasons. Will we explore the human sacrifice and barbaric rituals of the Aztecs? I'd like to think we will, but we probably won't, because they are the victims of very obvious and oppressive villains like Horcos. No nuance here, no exploration of culture necessary, just one big bad villain versus an oppressed underdog. That's all we need, right? Some may say I'm asking too much, but it wasn't too much for the first three years of For Honor, so I'd like to think that we could get back to something a little bit more realistic. And third, this is the third problem. This has made all war and heath more essentially meaningless. Let me ask you a question and be honest, okay? Be really honest. Does any of what we've seen in heath more from year six to now feel like a war? Let's explore it. In year six, season one, we retold the story of Ramiel and the Chalice of Immortality. Great story, but it doesn't have anything to do with the current war. Year six, season two, told about Bolthorn bringing the Magi to Heathmore. Neat story, again, but the Magi aren't directly tied to the faction war, and they haven't picked Chimera or Horcos to back. In fact, their primary reason for staying was to try and fix the damage done by the bracelet. In Year 6 Season 3, we battled the Jorogumo and the Yokai of the Mire. Great season. Awesome stuff there, but does it have anything to do with the overall war? Year 6 Season 4 had Horcos draw the Ephira over to Heathmoor. This finally connects to the Chimera and Horcos war at last, but it doesn't connect to the Samurai, the Knights, the Vikings, or the Wulin. Do they just not exist as factions anymore? Are they merely cosmetics and background for the civil war going on? And then we have Year 7 Season 1, in which an Inquisition is put in place to weed out heresies against Orcos. Well, is that what you'd call a war? It's more like just rooting out insurgents or cleaning house. And now we have Orcos ransacking the Aztecs and bringing back a prisoner. And what does that have to do with Chimera or the faction war? As you can see, we've gradually shifted from any backdrop of war and are now telling small stories where Horcos just does bad things and people react to it. Horcos did bad things to Afira, so Afira showed up to fight back. Horcos did bad things to innocent people, so in Inqu Inquisitor Yen Chen rose up to stop them. Horcos did bad things to the Aztecs, so now the Aztecs are going to come and beat them up. This writing is not only repetitive, it causes us to forget the real reason we came to For Honor at all. These cultures, these beautiful, unique, and diverse cultures. Knights, Vikings, Samurai, Wu Lin. Look, small side stories are fine every now and then. Small little side events that can break from the war are nice once in a while, like the stories of Maiko and Ramiel. But the last three seasons in a row have all been Horcos just doing a bad thing and someone getting mad at them. And none of those angry parties were even Chimera-related. 
So what's the bloody point in a war if you're not showing a war? At the very least, with Star Wars, you can argue that it was the Empire versus a rebellion, and you were following Luke Skywalker on his path to defeating the Empire. Here, it's just like if the Empire didn't have a rebel group to fight at all, and it's just small pocket stories of the Reb of the Empire pissing off this one planet, and this one planet getting mad, but they're not strong enough to do anything about the Empire, so it means very little in the grand scheme of things. So, how do we fix this? The first step to getting Thrawn or Lore back on track, I feel, is to either dismantle Horkos entirely, or have them suffer a significant loss. Horkos right now is too strong. It's time to destroy their Death Star, so to speak. Put them on the defensive. Have them on the back foot. Let Chimera have a leg up. Let them have a victory. And then you can use that. Show the negative aspects of Chimera. The infighting. The mistrust. The breakdown on a cultural level. Show the cultures in conflict. Because I've always seen that as Chimera's biggest weakness. Chimera is only unified against a single enemy. Kind of like what happened when the factions came together to fight Apollyon. But once Apollyon was gone, what did the factions do? They started fighting each other again. Have Astria and Horko step down a little so that now Chimera starts to fight amongst themselves. Have these different cultures start rising up against each other. It would be a natural progression and tie into what happened with Apollyon. It would be brilliant and one of the better moves Astria made. You could also explore new cultures, like with these new cultures like the Athera and the Magi and the Aztecs coming to Heathmore. Explore their cultures and how they clash with Heathmore. Show the Aztecs sacrificing humans. Show the Ephira taking slaves or becoming slaves. Show the Vikings pillaging again. Step back into the cultures you advertised. Why? Because, and I, and I, don't, mean this in a, I don't mean this to sound insulting, but this is no longer for honor. This is, and then Horkos did blank. Because each season is that, and then Horkos did this. Look, Horkos was fine for year four and five. They, they were okay. But now they've outlived their welcome. They've become the boogeymen of For Honor that is detracting from the lore and has become a writing crutch. These writers are either unable or unwilling to explore the culture of these warriors and their nuance, so instead they fall back on an easy villain to blame for everything. It's weak tier writing, especially for a game that could do so much better. We have cultures to explore. You've brought in a bunch of them. You've brought in the Magi, the Ephira, the Aztecs. You have stuff to explore. You have whole new revolutionary ideas to look into here, but instead of even considering those things, you're just going to a villain. Why? Because you don't want to potentially demonize these new cultures that you're bringing in. Oh, it's fine if we demonize the Knights and make them out to be bigoted crusaders. It's fine if we demonize the Vikings and make them look like asshole marauding thieves. But we don't want to demonize any of these other cultures. It's not about demonization. It's about nuance. Recognizing the good and bad of each culture. You used to be pretty good at that, For Honor. Now, some of you Horkos fans out there are going to tell me, Raven, I like Horkos. That's fine. Feel free to like them. But you do have to acknowledge that they have become For Honor's crutch lately. They have become the weak link in the chain in For Honor storytelling. Besides... If you really like Horko so much, are you satisfied with how they've been portrayed so far? Wouldn't you like to see more to their ideology and approach to the world beyond just doing bad things? Maybe, maybe we should try approaching this like adults who expect more than that. Maybe we should look at the why they do bad things. Because here's the scary thing. To prevent people like the Nazis from riding again, we must understand what led to the formation of the Nazis. The ideology that led to their creation. There has to be a why the villain faction exists and a what the villain faction wants to better understand who that villain faction is. So if we want Horkos to be anything meaningful, we need to understand why they exist and what they want. There was a time where they kind of sort of explored that, where it was they wanted to reignite Apollyon's ideals. Now they're just not. We can't even pretend like they're trying to... Like, people have now made excuses to me. Look, Astra isn't trying to be Apollyon. You're misunderstanding it. Okay, if she isn't trying to be Apollyon, then what is she trying to be? What does she want? What is she out for? Why is Horkos a thing? What is their ultimate goal? Is it to bring peace through tyranny? Well, okay, but that means we need a good guy who's going to counter them to create this war. See, that's the problem. 
We don't know what Horkos is after. Are they trying to be Apollyon or are they not trying to be Apollyon? What is Horkos? Maybe if we explored them a little bit more, we could actually see something unique there. For honor riders out there, hear me and hear me well. The first step on the path to fixing your lore, Horkos has to be addressed. You cannot keep relying on them to be your catalyst for each new seasonal conflict. If you don't change course soon, your lore will become stale, uninteresting, and even more disgustingly repetitive. You need to expand. Think beyond just what the villain does wrong, but what the culture you want to involve goes too far, or when the culture intercedes on another. Explore beyond just your villain faction. Imagine a season in which the Vikings grew in power and started raiding all the other territories so they had to fight back against the Vikings. Imagine a season where the Wulin get a boost in strength and launch a massive invasion force from China into Heathmore. Imagine a season where the Ephira gain reinforcements from their Islamic Empire and start a massive jihad on Ashfeld and Valkenheim. Imagine a season where the Samurai get a new emperor and decide to launch a full-scale assault on the Knights to claim their territory in the name of a militaristic utopia. Imagine a season where Chimera actually forces Horkos to retreat, but Griffin's leadership is challenged by other chiefs and leaders of various factions and groups, and Chimera shatters under their own democracy. The stories are right there waiting. But to make them happen, Horkos must, at the very least, step back. Because Horkos still works as a villain faction, but in order for the villain to be truly terrifying, they need to be seen as a threat. Make them back off bide their time, wait for the opportune moment, and then return when a villain is needed to return the world to what Apollyon foresaw. Because right now all they are is just the big bad boogeyman. But the boogeyman is only scary when you don't see them. That about wraps up this video, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to check out the new channel if you like me doing these kind of writing discussion videos. And I will see you in my next video, take care.